Tonight's a Salaha Bucha. Salaha is the name of the month in the Pali calendar. Bucha means homage. Now we're not paying homage to the month, we're paying homage to an event that happened on the full moon of this month, two months after the Buddha's awakening. He gave his first Dharma talk and he got his first noble disciple. It was the point at which the Triple Gem became complete. The Dharma is always there. The Buddha gained awakening in the month of May. Then when he taught his first disciple, that gave us the Sangha. So we pay homage to that event. Because for those of us who practice, this is one of the, the big events in the history of the world. Not only was someone able to gain awakening, but he was also able to teach others to gain awakening. He left behind the teachings so that we can get an awakening as well. He started out by talking about two extremes that had to be avoided in the path to awakening. And the reason for that, of course, was because the people he taught were very much enamored of the idea that awakening could be found through austerities. You may know the story. The Buddha had been practicing austerities for six years, saw that they didn't lead to the attainment of the deathless that he sought. So he asked himself, was there an alternative path? He remembered a time when, when he was young, he'd been practicing jhana, or spontaneously entered jhana while he was sitting under a tree. And he asked himself, why am I afraid of that pleasure? the pleasure of the jhana. He realized there's nothing blameworthy about it, nothing to be afraid of. And something inside him said, this could be the path. But he had to stop starving himself, which is what he'd been doing for those six years, so he could regain enough physical strength in order to get the mind into that state of being centered. The five brethren, five monks who were anticipating his awakening, saw this and they lost faith in him. They said, he's given up, he's gone back to luxurious life, and so they left him. So he was alone on the night of his awakening. And then for seven weeks he experienced the bliss of awakening, the bliss of release. <clears throat> Coming out of those seven weeks, he asked himself, can this be taught? And at first he was discouraged, realizing how difficult it was going to be, because it was very subtle teaching. And then Brahma came down and was realized that if the Buddha didn't teach, he wouldn't be a complete Buddha and the world would be bereft of a Buddha. There would only be a private Buddha. So he came down and said, there are people with only a little dust in their eyes. They will understand. So he invited the Buddha to teach. The Buddha then surveyed the world with his own knowledge and realized what the Brahma said was true. So that was seven weeks after his awakening. It took him a week to find the people to teach. First he thought of teaching excuse me, teaching his old teachers, the ones who had taught him states of formless jhana. But he realized that they had passed away. They left the five brethren. So he set out. It took him a week to get to Sarnath, where they were staying. They saw him coming. At first they were disinclined to even pay him respect. But as he approached, there was something about the old habits they couldn't couldn't stop. So they treated him with respect, but they still called him friend, which is a way you address equals or people who are inferior to you. And he said, don't call me friend anymore. I'm a Buddha. And they said, how can you be a Buddha? You gave up the practice. He said, no, I didn't. I found an alternative way. They still didn't believe him, and they said, have I ever made this claim before? And they realized that he was a very truthful person, so they were willing to listen to him. So I had to start out by saying that the path of austerities was an extreme that had to be avoided, that it was just as ignoble as the path of sensual desires. That's when he set out the, the middle way. Middle not in the sense that it's halfway between pleasure and pain. Middle in the sense that he uses pleasure and he uses pain for a higher purpose. The path is made out of eight factors. Right view, 
right resolve, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. You know, we boil down to three. Discernment, virtue, concentration. Now usually we, when we hear those three terms as part of the triple training, virtue comes first, followed by concentration, followed by discernment. But here discernment comes first. In the sense that you have to start out with some understanding of what you're doing if you're going to practice. And then as you practice, your discernment grows. It's not like you use discernment, then drop discernment, and then go to right resolve, and then drop right resolve and go on to right speech. Each of the factors of the path increases your discernment. Discernment in terms of right view starts out with seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths, that there is stress and suffering. Not only that, but it's the five clinging aggregates. And this clinging is caused by craving. That's the second noble truth. Stress and suffering can be ended when that clinging is abandoned. That's the third noble truth. The fourth is the, is the eightfold path, the path to the end of suffering. And when you first hear this, you can decide that it makes sense. What its implications are, you don't know until you actually try to put it into practice. That's what right resolve is. You decide that given that the mind is causing itself its suffering through its craving, you've got to set your mind on cleaning up the mind. Right resolve means basically resolving on renunciation, resolving on non-ill will and non-harmfulness. -har Or in other words, you realize that your actions are going to have to be pure. So you make that intention, and then you follow through with that, with the right speech and right action and right livelihood. And in the course of putting it into practice, you learn a lot about the mind. Right speech and right action train you in the precepts, which involves training you in mindfulness and alertness. But then you realize simply following the path outside is not enough. You've got to work on your mind. That's what right effort is all about. You develop the desire to abandon unskillful states if they've arisen and to prevent them from arising if they hadn't. Give rise to skillful states that haven't yet arisen, and when they have arisen, you, you develop the desire to keep them going and so they grow. Because otherwise your practice of the precepts is, goes against the grain and there's going to be a constant struggle. But if you can make your mind actually want to be skillful, that's most of the battle right there. And then right effort gets folded into right mindfulness as you center the mind, say in the body with the breath. Get to know the breath energies in the body. You're mindful, alert, and ardent. Ardent here is basically what right effort is in this practice. You're holding the breath in mind, and you're watching it. You notice the breath energies in the body, like we're doing right now. Where do you feel them? They're, they're central parts of the body where the breath energies are, are prominent. Parts of the body where the breath energy seems to flow, those are the breath channels. And the reason this is a good place to center the mind is because when you're with the breath, you're right next to the mind. Any changes in the mind, you're going to see them in the breath. But you can also use the breath to put the mind in a skillful state. Because one of the things that actually shapes the state of your mind is the f sense of feeling. And of course, the things you think about, you think about the breath and you create a sense of well-being. You can focus at the tip of the nose, focus at the base of the throat, you can focus on the palate, in the middle of the head, in the middle of the chest, right above the navel. There are lots of places where you can focus your attention. And as you're there, you're in the present moments, you get to see your mind more clearly. So even subtle things come up, you know them. This too increases your discernment.
And as you stay with the breath consistently and evenly, it brings the mind into concentration. As the Buddha said, all the other factors of the path are basically requisites for right concentration. But has to be right, it's not just the mind being centered, but it's centered with right view and right resolve, and all the other factors gather together. It's a gathering of all the good things in the mind. The term in Pali, jittas segat, jittas egakata, which sometimes translated as one pointedness of mind, but the word point, aga, is not so much of a point as it's a gathering place which is another meaning of the word in Pali. you got the mind gathered around one spot, and when it's gathered, everything in the mind becomes clear. Because you're not only at one spot, you're trying to take whatever sense of ease and well-being come, that come from the meditation, come from being concentrated on the breath, and let them spread out so they fill the whole body, permeate the whole body. In the Buddha's words, to the point where there's nothing in the body that's not permeated by that sense of ease and well-being. And then you spread your awareness so it fills the whole body as well. And it's here that you really get to see the mind, really understand what's going on in the mind. And you do this with discernment, and you do this with virtue. In other words, you're honest with yourself, and you see things clearly. You can see exactly when the craving that causes suffering arises. You can see the suffering go up. When the craving is gone, you can see the suffering go down. You start seeing connections that you never noticed before. And then you see that you're the one that's causing the suffering through your craving. It's not like suffering or unpleasant things or things you can push away, because after all, you're entangled in them because you created them. The way to stop them is just to stop doing them, to see that it's not worth the effort. That's how you learn how to let go without aversion. You simply see that it's not worth the effort you put into it. You can stop doing it, and when you stop doing it, that's when things cease. So this is how all these factors of the path work on that factor, the third noble truth, which is that when you l let go of the craving, the suffering ceases. And this is how these factors help you let go of the craving, and you do it with knowledge. All too often we let go of craving simply to grab on to another one. But when you're really knowledgeable about what's happening, you can let it go and you don't have to pick up anything else in its place. And that's why all eight factors are needed. We start with right view, and the other factors build on right view and make it even wiser. Which is why the wisdom or discernment come comes at the beginning of the path, and it grows as the path grows, and it becomes complete when you've got all eight factors working together. Now our problem usually as we're practicing is that we're, we've got a couple of the factors, but we don't have all eight. The mind can be still, but there's not much in terms of right discernment. Or you can be practicing the precepts, but not with, without much concentration. And the factors, when they're not supported by one another, don't show their full, their full power. So try to bring all of them together, because they're all interconnected. They're not separate things. Concentration is simply a higher form of virtue. Discernment is a higher form of concentration and virtue. And the discernment then enables you to improve your virtue, improve your concentration. All these factors work together. This, the Buddha said, is the noble path, because it leads to a noble destination. It, it honors our desire for a noble happiness. So the way to pay homage to the Buddha, to pay homage to that event, is to take the teaching that the Buddha gave and put it into practice, so that your right view will develop, your discernment will develop. Your Virtue and concentration will all grow together. And 
and brings you closer to the, the goal that the Buddha was teaching. As he said, this leads to peace, it leads to clear knowing, it leads to release, it leads to unbinding, the total end of suffering. That's a possibility that the Buddha set out. Now, one of the members of the Five Brethren actually followed through long and with enough discernment and enough insight while he was listening that he actually gained his first glimpse of the Deathless, just listening to the talk. Which is why that this is a night of homage both to the Dhamma and the Sangha. I was reading a while back someone saying that Wisaka Bucha is in homage to the Buddha, Asalha Bucha is in homage to the Dhamma, and Maka Bucha is in homage to the Sangha. But with the Salaha and Maka, in it's both cases, it's a specific Dharma teaching and there was a Sangha present. The Dharma and the Sangha go together. So tonight's a night in homage of the Dharma and the Sangha, just as Maka Bucha is. So take the Dharma and put it into your heart. So the qualities of the Noble Sangha can grow in your heart as well. Fulfilling the Buddha's intent, he gained awakening not just for himself, but so he could teach. And other people could gain awakening from his teaching. That's not the case that he can make us awaken. We have to cooperate. But the path is wide open. Don't let your defilement stand in the way. <laughs>